God. Good it's good to see you all today. It's good to be in the house of the Lord with all of you, uh, those that I know and those I haven't seen before or met, met, met before. I want to introduce myself. My name is Brian Lamb. I uh, once attended this church. I'm still a member of this church, but I attend with my husband down in Wilson Manor, the Church of the Holy Spirit song. Um, I came to this church in 2006 after being a Pentecostal preacher for all of my life. So for those of you who've never experienced Pentecostal preaching, you have nothing to worry about this morning. <laughs> I always uh, find it strange that when I have a little bit of uh, an increase in volume or have some dynamics in my speaking, people think that I'm bringing hellfire and brimstone because I raised my voice just a little bit. And it's like, oh, honey, you have no idea what hell <laughs> You just don't know. And I'm so glad that you don't know. Because that's just awful stuff. Just awful stuff. Rana, thank you so much for singing and leading singing this morning. We appreciate you. Let's give her a good time. So this morning, we're going to talk a little bit about peace like the river. And I want to ask you a question. When you hear that phrase, what do you think of? Do you think of the song? What, what, do you, what else do you think of? Tom. Tom? The River Jordan. The Jordan River. Okay, what else? Yeah, campfire. Singing around the campfire? Content. Content? What else? The rocks. A lot of rocks? <laughs> Yes, what else? I'm sorry? Fluidity. Fluidity. Nice. Nice. One more. West Virginia. <laughs> the Gall River, Gully River, what is it called? Yeah. The Gully River, something like that. Well, I'm going to tell you what I think of when I think of peace, a life, a river. I think of this. Is it changing? No, it is. It is back here. <laughs> Well, let me tell you what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about the Papuari River in Costa Rica. I think that there's two young men that are celebrating a honeymoon today in Costa Rica. Am I right about that? Did I hear that correctly? Maybe they're going to this river. I don't know. I don't know that that's the way to spend a honeymoon. Uh, although when I was there in 2004, I was there uh, with a buddy of mine, and we decided that we were going to go uh, whitewater rafting down the Kapoi River, which is one of the top five whitewater rafting rivers in the world. What I did not know is that we were going right at the beginning of rainy season. <laughs> in in the in the uh, uh, you know in the you know the uh, rainforest basically, so lots of rain all the time, big raindrops that will knock you out. It felt like they, they were they were so large. And so the, the, the guide told us there may be some differences on this trip than we usually have because the river can rise very, very quickly because of the amount of rain that's falling. So please pay attention to what we tell you. Okay, I can do that. So it was my buddy and me and then a, 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 a couple that were just married. The young man was from uh, Seattle, Washington and his new bride, a uh, beautiful young lady, was from Finland. They both showed up to the side of the river in the middle of the rainforest, wearing blue jeans, a polo shirt, and a, and a sweater wrapped around them. You know, kind of preppy. They're very, very preppy. And I kind of looked at them because I was in like shoes that I didn't care if they lived or died, and a pair of uh, swim trunks, and an old ratty t-shirt. And I've been whitewater rafting before, and I knew that this was going to be an adventure. But when I saw these two, I kind of asked them, have you ever been whitewater rafting before? And they were like, oh, no. We're here to see the beauty of nature. And I was like, Dad, you're going to see a lot of nature. You're going to see a lot, I'm telling you. And, uh, and then I said, um, do you have clothes to change into? Oh, no, we, we don't really plan on getting wet. <laughs> Oh, and in my mind, I was thinking so many things, but that was one of the times where the Holy Spirit gave me grace, and I did not say what I was thinking, right? So I began to tell them, this is one of the most powerful rivers in the world. We are, we are at the beginning of rainy season, 
what we are going to experience today could be very, very perilous. Please, 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 if you don't want to do this, don't get on the rack. And the lady said, and I quote, this is nature. What can be, what can be dangerous about nature? <laughs> An hour and a half later, I found myself in a whirlpool after being thrown out of the raft. I was going around and around and around, and I could not get to safety. Someone had to come with a, uh, a kayak and kind of pin me against a rock to keep me from being taken down over and over again by the strong current. Before I had gone over, I was stuck. I had gone over the side of the raft, but my foot was stuck under the strap, and I was under the raft for maybe 15, 20 seconds, struggling to get free. I was nearly drowning. But when I came to the surface of the water, what I heard was these, these, these uh, tour guides, or whitewater raft guides, guides calling, La Chica! La Chica! They were screaming to the top of their lungs. La Chica, the lady from Finland, who had never been whitewater rafting before, who said that nature wasn't dangerous, was nowhere to be found. Oh. And as I kept going around this whirlpool, there seemed to be like a fallen tree that was sticking up out of the water that had been there for a while. There, were no, there was no uh, greenery on it. It was just a big trunk. And down beneath that uh, water, I saw what looked like something that was yellow, and that was the color of our helmets. And all I could think in that moment is, oh dear Lord, that lady is stuck under this tree. And I just began to pray, God, please help her, please help her. Help the folks that are going to help, because people were on the banks throwing ropes and trying to help us. And um, thankfully, it wasn't her. It was just something that I saw. Um, she actually was 500 yards downriver, missing a couple of teeth, cut abrasions on her face very, very badly. And on the side of that river, the husband and the wife were vehemently saying, we will not get back in the boat. Mm -hmm in the middle of the rainforest. And I told the young man, I appreciate your fear. I appreciate what you've experienced today, but you have to get in the boat. No, we're going to walk out of here. <laughs> we are in the middle of a rainforest in Central America. There is no walking out of here. There are cats, there are snakes, there's monkeys, there's all sorts of things. You think the river is rough? The journey over that hill to the closest road six hours away is going to be even rougher. You have to get in the boat. Reluctantly, they did. We did the first aid, all the stuff that we could do. Cleaned our shoes, just covered in uh, like volcanic sand. The soil is just very, very rich and dark there. And, um, the intent was to go to a campsite and stay there for a couple of days. And then the agreement was they would hike from there with a family that lived on the campsite out to the road um, the next morning. So having lost our partners, having lost our, uh, the foursome on the raft, we had to leave a couple of days later. So it was just me and my buddy and a guy who sat on top of all of our supplies and an ice chest using uh, oars, if you would, and my buddy and I were just rowing as hard as we could. The river was at near uh, peak levels. Uh, it rained all day the day that we uh, ran out, and, and I wish you could see the pictures. Oh, they're amazing. Um, but here's the deal. There was nothing peaceful about that river. In fact, uh, there are several pictures. If you want to see them, you can look on my Facebook profile uh, under the album. It's okay, Rich. You don't have to. Okay. Um, under the album, uh, The River Wild, it'll show you some of the pictures. Some of the pictures you see me, 
And then some of the pictures you don't. All you see is water because we completely submerged under that river. So that was probably one of the hardest, one of the hardest working days of my life. And the only time there was peace in that whole experience was when we got to deep water. Because there the rocks didn't really matter. Oh, look at that. Can you see it now? That's just the beginning of sorrow. You can go through and just show some of the rest if you'd like. This is, on, this is two days afterwards, uh, minus the honeymoon. Well, we got one up. Yay! Well, that's enough. That's enough. You can turn the lights back on. That's all right. You can just leave that up if you'd like as, as a reference. Don't you just love modern technology? So that's what I think of. That's the image that comes to mind when I hear the phrase, peace like a river, because I'm telling you. There's no, oh, there we are. Now you see me, now you don't. I'm underwater there. <laughs> kind of crazy, isn't it? So there's nothing peaceful about this. When I think of this, I think about how we live and how life is like a river. How there are times when the water is calm, when the water is gentle, when the water runs deep and the obstacles in the path of the water doesn't create this mess uh, that you see on the screen behind you. That is like life, isn't it? There's a time in our lives where we're flowing along, everything is great, and then all of a sudden the rains come, the, the river fills up, and then it's like nothing we've ever experienced before. And sometimes, somehow, maybe, somebody's going to go overboard and lose, and lose the safety of the raft, lose the safety of being with friends and family in the boat. And where we end up can, can be either bad or worse, <laughs> you know? Anybody relate to me? You ever had an experience that way where <laughs> life just kind of tossed you around and you didn't know where, which end was up and you felt like you were overwhelmed, that you were going to drown, that you could not catch a breath of air? Hmm? Anyone ever felt that way? Yeah. Well, Jesus tells us <laughs> about the peace that he offers us. He tells us in our opening scripture today, I give you peace, my peace I leave with you, not as the world gives. That's not the peace I give you, I give you my peace. Well, I don't know if you've noticed it or not, but there's a lot going on in the world, isn't there? <laughs> We kind of know more about it than we used to because there's 24-hour news channels, there's Facebook, there's Instagram, there's Snapchat. Anything you want to know from anywhere in the world can be known just like that. I'm sorry? Yeah, and things you don't want to know, absolutely. And so it seems like we are just in a boiling pot all the time of controversy, of worry, of strife, of pointing fingers and pointing fingers back, of name calling and being offended and not being offended, being righteous and being self-righteous and being humbled and sad, being mournful and prayerful as we have been the last day or two because of the events in Texas and Ohio. Nothing peaceful about it the stuff we see on the television, is there? But yet Jesus speaks and says, I am going away, but if I go, I promise you, I'm going to send you a comforter. I'm going to send an advocate, the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will lead you and guide you and will give you my peace. So what is the peace of God? Well, Jesus says, I'm giving it to you. So it's a gift. Right? What do you do with gifts? Not some of you. I know you exchange them the very next day. <laughs> what do you do with gifts? What's the first thing you do with a gift? Ah, uh, before that. Before that. Before that. Before that. You receive it. You receive it. The peace of God is not something that is foisted upon us. God doesn't say, you will take my peace. Take it down. 
That's not a loving God, is it? See, folks, that was not hell, fire, and brimstone. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, that was not hell, fire, and brimstone. We call that dynamics. It's a fancy way of saying hell, fire, and brimstone. But God doesn't force God's peace on us. It is a gift. The choice is ours whether to receive it. I want to ask you today, do you receive God's peace? Yes. Really? <coughs> Let me ask you a question. I love it when people answer so quickly. <laughs> yes! Have you ever responded, have you responded this week in anger to something that you've seen on television, on Twitter, on Facebook? Yes. Have you? At work, have you had a knee-jerk reaction to anything? I should hear, yes! <laughs> so I'm going to ask you again, do you receive the peace of God? Not always. It is a choice, isn't it? It really is a choice. Receive it or reject it. The choice is ours. And we get presented with this choice many, many, many times each and every day. You know when that one person calls you that just gets on your very last nerve and you don't want to answer the phone, but yet something prompts you, maybe I should answer because they may really, really need something and then 5, 10, 20, 30 minutes into the conversation you're asking yourself, why did I pick up the phone? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You ever had that situation? Maybe that person at work that gets on your last nerve, I mean your very last nerve, and you want to interact with them in a way that's not very peaceful, you have a choice on how to treat that person, right? Even if that person doesn't treat you kindly or respectfully, guess what? The choice is still ours to make. Amen? Amen. So it is a gift. We receive it or we exchange it. I would much rather receive the peace of God in my life than exchange it for the peace that the world gives. Jesus says, I give you my peace, not as the world gives. Well, what kind of peace does the world give? Like that picture behind me. Strife, turmoil. Really, literally, if we think of peace, we think of the absence of war, right? The absence of war. Jesus is saying, my peace is still real, is still powerful, is still sustaining, even in the midst of war, in the midst of chaos, in the midst of your world being turned upside down. My peace, I leave with you. Receive it. One of the things that keeps us from receiving the peace of God is dualistic thinking. Dualistic thinking is this. I grew up in a church that was very dualistically oriented. Heaven or hell, turn or burn, right or wrong, black, white, left, right, down, rip up. You with me? Red, blue, mm. us, them. That's dualistic thinking. It's us against them. A couple of weeks ago, I had the opportunity to sit in a meeting with the leaders and representatives of several large churches in Fort Lauderdale. The grandson of a very prominent evangelist who is no longer with us, and the mayor of Fort Lauderdale. And it was just a group that we were meeting to talk about things, just to have dialogue. Specifically, dialogue on how the church can treat its gay and lesbian transgender brothers and sisters differently and better and more like Jesus. Now, you can imagine 
I went into this meeting thinking there's going to be some really, 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 really uh, evangelical uh, conservative people who are going to be very dualistic in the way they think. And it turned out that wasn't the case at all. A lot of them were like, yeah, we need to do better. This is not our part. We need to have more dialogue. And the whole night was just really interesting. But then I found the conversation turning toward politics, mm. uh -huh. right? The conversation turned toward politics, and then it became an us against them kind of thing. So it's funny how we can choose to be dualistic in one avenue, in one setting, and not dualistic in the other, isn't it? And so I just kind of spoke up and I said, here's, here's the issue. We are always looking for an other to blame, another to point our finger at and say, oh, if this would just change, if he or she would just change, if that group would just change, then things would be better. And the reality is the peace of God is offered to us all. And in that peace, we can extend a hand of welcome and a hand of friendship, of brother and sisterhood. Amen? Amen. So I want to challenge you today. If you're struggling with peace in your relationship, you're struggling with peace at work, if you're struggling with peace in religion, <laughs> let go of some of the right versus wrong. Our opening reading from the Sufi poet and prophet from uh, 1300 AD, uh, he was a Muslim, Rumi. Something powerful. Out beyond the ideas of right doing and wrong doing. There's a field, and I'll meet you there. There has to come a point in our lives where we let others be, and we be grounded and rooted in the peace of God. Sure, stand up for truth when it's appropriate, but it's not always appropriate to demand that someone sees you as right. Sometimes it's not really <coughs> worth the battle. Sometimes it's much better just to sit across the table with some fried chicken and some green beans and some mashed potatoes and gravy and some good old homemade biscuits and just have fellowship. That is the peace of God. Is there an undercurrent there? Absolutely. Are there differences there? Yes. But oh, in the realm of God, there's a field. And I want to meet. Colossians 3.15 says, Let the peace of God rule in your heart. Let it rule. Sounds like a choice, doesn't it? So today, I leave you with a choice. Will you receive the peace of God today, tomorrow, and all the days to come? In every situation, in every interaction, will you receive the peace of God, even if it's peace like a river? Receive and live. God bless you. Amen.